of her lungs and stuff, and so she was doing somewhat better yesterday. So uh, remember them in prayer, if you will, and the Lord will help them. Uh, other than that, uh, I spoke to Brother Jim this morning, and it uh, seemed like they had a good service, had some visitors today. He was real excited about that. Appreciate the Lord blessing in that. Uh, anybody else have a prayer request for Sunday school class this morning? Y'all did, ain't you? I'm going to have to scream and holler and run up and down the aisle. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, Numbers chapter number 14. Uh, we're going to pick back up from where we left off out of chapter 13. We're in our journey through the wilderness. Uh, I remind you that, uh, that God has uh, brought them a long way. Uh, he had given, given them so much uh, in the book of Exodus, uh, they shouldn't be where they're at in chapter 13 and 14. They have no excuse for this. Just like sometimes we don't have any excuse. Amen. 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 And, uh, but they're, uh, they're here now, and, uh, and God is uh, going to be dealing with some things in this chapter that are very hard. And, and I was thinking last night as I was trying to... Uh, study and prepare and all that kind of stuff and and uh, this chapter is kind of hard to bring what's good out of it really is uh, I'm going to try before I get done but uh, I, want, I want us to notice several things if I had to title this chapter I would title it the consequences of unbelief the consequences of unbelief or you could put it uh, this way can't versus can and then I thought about uh, Cain never could. Yeah. Uh, that's true. That's and true. It? Cain never could. And, and that's where they're at here. Uh, last chapter they dealt with uh, the, the 12 spies. They went into uh, Canaan and they spied out the land. And in the end of chapter number uh, 13 and verse number uh, 33, we, we left them with their grasshopper mentality. Uh, they said, we're as grasshoppers in their sight. Uh, they, were, they got their eyes off of God and on their self. And that is always a mistake. They got their eyes off of God and they thought, man, we're nothing. We can't do this. And, and may I say this about that kind of mentality, uh, that unbelief, it spreads like wildfire in people. It's, it's like they had that gender reveal party out in California the other day. And I don't know what they did, but they winded up burning thousands of acres down. And, and it started from just a little bitty thing. And it got so big. And, and that, that is why, uh, I guess they, they set something on fire trying to, I don't know how they did all that. They blew up some tannerite. Okay. That's wise in the middle of California. But, but something small has become so much bigger. And, and so what happens is when, when, when you have unbelief in people, especially in your leaders, you remember the 12 spies. These 12 spies were leaders of their tribes. They were hand-picked men, and they came back and gave an evil report because of their unbelief. And so their, their unbelief, it began to spread like wildfire in the camp. And we get to uh, verse number 1 in chapter number 14, and the Bible said, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt. Or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be, be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. And what I want to notice out of this chapter in the beginning of this anyway is the consequences of their unbelief in the nation of Israel. First of all, we see there's crying and weeping. Un 
unbelief is is it breeds different things in our lives. And, and it will bring forth a lot of weeping. That's what's happening here to these people. They, they're not sure where they're going to wind up. They think, well, we're all going to die, or our children are not going to make it, or this is going to happen. And, that, and the uncertainty of it all, they begin to weep and to cry because of it. And then it started causing murmuring in verse number 2. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses. And Aaron. Uh, last I checked, God's men weren't the ones not believing. It was those other ten. But now they're accusing him of the wrongdoing, the man of God, or the men of God. And they began to murmur against him. This is relative to our day, okay? This happens all the time in churches, in different places. When people get out of the will of God, they begin to get away from faith, and they start operating in the power of the flesh yep. and in what they can see and do themselves. They begin to murmur and complain against where the man of God is trying to go. Amen. 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 That's what happens. Now, I'm going to try to get to some good stuff later, okay? So don't think, all right? Uh, but they're crying, they're weeping, they're murmuring. All of this is coming because of what? Their unbelief. Their unbelief. Notice this. In the end of verse 2, it said, Would God that we had died? Now they got a wish to be dead. That's pretty sad, isn't it? I'd rather die than do this. I don't know if they're suicidal, but they are wishing to be dead. So that it would all just go away. And all this is stemming from their unbelief, their fear. There's consequences to unbelief. These are part of them. These are symptoms of it at least. Verse number three, we see a desire to return to Egypt. Now, I mentioned this uh, the other night, but uh, I've never wanted to go back to Egypt. I don't want to do that. I don't want to go back to the world. I don't want nothing to do with that. The world has nothing to offer me. I remember what it was before I got saved. I, I don't want nothing to do with that. But these people had gotten to the place in their life in their journey trying to get to this land of Canaan, that they began to have a desire to go backward instead of forward. A desire to return to Egypt. And can I say, I've seen a few folks do that. I've seen a few folks out of our church right here that has done that. Amen. I seen somebody the other day who used to be a member of this church has gone to the world. Could sing, could play, could do all of them. But departed in the back. Um, a desire to return to Egypt. What a horrible place to be in. To not want to go on with God, but to go back to the world. Then they said, uh, we, we're going to make us a captain in verse 4. And they said one another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Now they're wanting a different leader. That happens in church splits, doesn't it? They get them another leader. <laughs> yep. What they do is they, they, they get that leader and, they, and most of the time they leave with that leader. And they go out and start them something else. And um, but nobody thinks all that out before they do this stuff. They don't think about where am I going to be 10, 15 years from now with my family? What's going to happen to my children? If I pull them out of this church where the preacher's preaching the truth and the right things and with the power of God and all that stuff's going on in their life, and they pull them out of that and they go somewhere else and they start something else without God. What happens to them? 
happens to them. I could give you a bunch of illustrations, but I don't want to go that deep. But uh, that's a dangerous thing to do. Very dangerous thing to do. Then in verse number 10, we had not read this yet, but uh, I want to notice this, another consequence or, or symptom of what's happening. It says, but all the congregation bade stone them with stones. Now they have murderous thoughts. Now all this has started from unbelief. And man, it's just ratcheting up and it's getting worse and worse. They don't know that we, what if God, we just died. Now they're talking about, we're going to kill you. It's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I've seen a little bit of that. Kill and eat the preacher, baby. <laughs> That's barbecue. Roasting with fire. That has happened here before, hasn't it? Murderous thoughts. What a horrible place to be. Yeah. Want to kill somebody. <laughs> and all they've ever done is try to lead you to a wonderful place. Mm -hmm. What a horrible thing. So they got murderous thoughts. Uh, let's skip down to chapter. I'm, I'm going to come back to some of these other verses and other things. But uh, Verses 22 and 23. Now we see they're being rejected by God. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. They're, uh, God's done with that. And he does pardon them, and we'll look at that in just a minute. He pardons the nation, but they some in that nation, they ain't going to never see Canaan now. Chastisement is coming. And, and there's a bunch of these folks, in fact, most of these folks, they're never going to cross over Jordan because of this. They're going to die in the wilderness. They're rejected by God. What a horrible place to be in as a child of God to have exercised unbelief to the point that you murmur, you complain, you want to uh, murder the, the man of God, you want to do this, you want to do that, and God says, okay, I'm He said, God wouldn't do that. Oh, yes, He will. Oh, yes, He will. So we live in the New Testament. I know. But He's still God. He's still God. And, and I guess as a, as a younger preacher, I wouldn't understand a lot of that. But now I'm getting a little older. I've been in the ministry over 30 years now. I've seen a few times. And I've seen God said, okay, I'm done with them. No more. I will not touch their life. I will not bless them. I will not help them. Rejected by God. Verse 32. We see uh, death in the wilderness. He says, but as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness. It's bad when God talks about you as a carcass. <laughs> when God says, okay, your carcass Jacob is going to die in the wilderness. Well, that's rough, ain't it? God's upset here. A lot of people don't believe God can get mad. <laughs> I believe it was Brother Jack preached years ago. God's coming and he's mad. Your carcass. There's death in the wilderness. Verse 36 and verse 37. We see the immediate judgment on the ten spies. He said, And the men which Moses sent to search the land, who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up a slander upon the land, even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. Yep. I mean, they're gone. Uh, well, that's a good message out here. Good count me, man. This is wonderful. God's going to take your sorry carcass and leave it out in the wilderness. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. I'm just trying to say, hey, look, unbelief is a dangerous thing. Yes, sir. Now, through this meeting, we didn't have a blow-out service. We had a really good services. We've had uh, God speaking to different people. Yeah. As, as, as standing up here watching and looking, I can see God touching this one and that one and the other one and, and dealing with hearts in many different ways. And, and uh, can I say this? It'd be a tragedy not to take what you've heard this week, the Word of God, and what God is, the Holy Ghost has put in your heart and not believe in God. What a tragedy that would be. There's consequences for not believing God. Consequences. Now, let's try to bring something a little better out of it for a moment. Let's look at the four who did not falter. The four who did not falter. And I believe this is very important that we see this in this chapter. Not everybody went the wrong way. And it's a minority that did right. But thank God for the minority. Thank God there was somebody that said, I'm not going down that road. Amen. I'm going to go with God. Look back at verse number 5. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephani, which uh, were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only prevail not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us, their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us, fear them not. Two fell down to pray, two stand up and preached. They didn't fall. Everybody else, as far as we know, is over 20 years old, is lying in fear and unbelief. They're murmuring, they're complaining, they're crying, they're, they're wanting to kill somebody. But these folk did not fall. They allowed God to stay true in their life. And they fell in and they prayed and they stood up and they preached. Hallelujah. Thank God for the for the few, amen, the few that stood for what was right. And listen, there's a lesson to be learned. There are going to be times in your life when there's just only a few. There's not going to be a big crowd. It's going to stand. I'm going to try to preach a little bit on standing this morning and look in the next service. But, but there's a lot of times in your life that it's just going to maybe be you and your family. I, I talked to Brother West on the phone quite a bit, and he's in Kishinev, Moldova. Most people don't know where Moldova is. And you, you, I'll mention that somebody got a friend in Moldova. Moldova, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a place over yonder by the Ukraine or over here, you know. And uh, but sometimes it can be long. I remember that day. <laughs> I remember being in Scotland all by myself. I remember that. But Jim wasn't there. David wasn't there. It's me, my wife, and kids. I remember that. And some days I don't talk. Some days I don't talk. <laughs> there's going to be a lot of times in your life that there may just be a few. Very few. What are you going to do with it? These four did not falter. They prayed and they preached. They 
they did what God said to them. Thank God for those that will not give in. The, the boys sing that song, oh, they're not boys, they're young men. Uh, the young men sing, uh, there's things we won't give over. Uh, talking about being a man of God, that kind of thing. Uh, I remember they used to sing a song, and, uh, I think the Rochester singing it too. I believe I remember Josh Stokes singing it here. The old preacher man. And as a crowd thing, he just stayed faithful. He preached and he preached and he preached. Thank God for people like that. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're men that uh, their message doesn't change, their God doesn't change, they just stay with it. They believe God. And and their their criteria for success is not numbers. Now, I know God, we're in the book of numbers. And I know God's interested in them. But in the middle of this book of numbers, I find four people that are right. That are standing. That are doing the right thing. That are believing God. That are acting upon their faith. All the rest of them are not. And that's not Right in the middle of the book of Numbers. <laughs> There's only four. The four who do not falter. Verse 11 and 12. Let's look at God's anger for just a moment. Uh, and the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and a mightier than they. God's upset here. He's mad. He's talking about smiting people. He's talking about disinheriting people. I just start over with Moses. <laughs> God's anger. Yeah. And then we see Moses' argument in verses 13 through 19. And Moses said unto the Lord, Then the Egyptians shall hear it. For thou broughtest up this people in thy might from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. For they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of a cloud and a pillar of fire by night. Now if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he sware unto them, therefore he hath slain them in the wilderness. And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of thy mercy, and as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. So Mark Moses is praying here, and in somewhat having, uh, presenting an argument, if you will, to God, please God, don't do this. We've already dealt with this in a previous passage. But what if Moses hadn't prayed? You remember in, in a couple chapters ago, he did. He was mad himself. And he just stood back. There was no prayer of Moses. And, and, and God was angry. And boy, that's a lot of people died. Real quick. What are you saying? I'm saying that though you may or may not agree with the direction and the, everything that the man of God is doing, I'm, I'm not preaching this for myself. I'm preaching this for your next pastor, okay? <laughs> though you may agree or disagree, be careful. 
you're going to need Him one day. Because there's time when we in our lives get all messed up. It sure will be nice for the man of God to be praying for you when you're all messed up with God. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. It might save your life. <laughs> it just might save your life. That's where these people are. So we see God's anger. We see Moses' argument. In verse 20, we, we see a pardon. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. Now this is not a pardon like you would think. He's pardoning, pardoning the nation. He's ready to wipe it all off and start all over. But because Moses prays and he asks God not to do that, he, he pardons the nation. That does not mean there's not going to be any punishment. He pardoned. But notice that's not the end of the sentence. Verse 21, But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. God's not going to let this sin just slide on by. There's going to be punishment for it. And so he makes a pronouncement in verses 21 through 35. And I won't read all those verses. Uh, God declares. He tells, look, we'll read a few verses. Because all, verse 22, all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice surely they shall not see the land which I swear to the Father neither shall any of them be provoked to see it uh, and he talks about Caleb uh, and all those things and in verse 29 again your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness uh, there, there's, there's a pronoun God declared this is okay I'm going to pardon this is what's going to happen He's not going to let this sin slide of unbelief any longer. He's going to turn them around and send them back to this wilderness. They've had what, nearly two, maybe two years or so to get Egypt out of them. They've been out of Egypt for, for nearly two years now or so. And, and uh, at least a little over a year. And, and, and God has been dealing with them, giving them, showing them, working with them being merciful to them, forgiving them. He's been doing this all along. And, and now he's to the point, okay, you just go back to the wilderness. And if you're over 20, you're going to die there. Your children that you said were going to be a prey to them, I'll let them go. It's your sort of car because it comes out right out of here. Now listen, I know we're in New Testament times. But I want you to understand that this book, this whole book was written for our admonition. I have seen people in New Testament times in my lifetime in the ministry the Lord has allowed me to be in. I've seen people die in the wilderness. Spiritually. They'll never get out of it. Unbelief is so dangerous. It is so dangerous. Uh, when Brother Howard and him go to Scotland, one of the key is faith. That is so key that you're going to believe God for what He told you to do. Whether there's a big crowd or a small crowd. And God, I hope y'all don't have to go through some of what we went through. I have stood at the, the front step of the church there in Monday and looked this way <laughs> and then looked that way and then looked back that way again and back and forth I went for 10 minutes and nobody comes. Nobody. So it's just me and my family still. That gets difficult after a little while, I'll just be honest with you. What carries you through those things? Faith. Faith does. 
Faith will carry you through those kind of times. I'm, I'm glad Brother Jim and Miss Kim hadn't had to have that. They've they had other things. But they ain't had to have that. Uh, and, and of course, I go into and I, and I get in prayer and I, and I ask God, what have I done wrong? Why? You do go through all of that. Uh, we have to have faith in God. Unbelief has horrible consequences. Horrible consequences. So we see a pardon, we see a pronouncement, and then lastly, let me say this, we see a presumption. They get all messed up here. And, and now God is judging them, those ten spies. They stood there and watched God kill them men. Ten men, they died right there. And everybody back says, oh God, <laughs> we better get our stuff back together. We better start going towards the land of Canaan. But it's too late for that. <clears throat> so they presumed that they could go forward. In verses 39, and I don't take time to read it all. And Moses told these things unto all the children of Israel, and people mourned greatly. And they rose up early in the morning and gathered them up into the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here, and we'll go up into the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. And Moses said, Wherefore now do you transgress the commandment of the Lord, but it shall not prosper? Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that you be not smitten before your enemies. It was too late. It was just too late. Did you say they confessed their sin? Yeah, thank God they did. <laughs> but it was too late for them to go on. Yep. It was too late. What a horrible place to be. What a horrible place to be. God has been dealing with you and working with you and forgiving you and giving you things and showing you things and all that stuff. And it finally dawns on you and it's too late. What a horrible place to be. And they presume that they could go up. You know the story. They uh, they get defeated before the armies. And uh, a bunch of them died, I presume. I want to make one last observation here. Up until verse number 9 of this chapter, And this is something I personally think, and, and I, I'm not going to break fellowship over something like this, but I, I just want to give you an observation of what I think. Uh, I believe up until verse 9, Moses and Aaron are praying, Joshua and Caleb are preaching. I believe if they were between verse 9 and verse 10, said, God, we're sorry. We were wrong. This is our fault. We're not going to go this way. I believe they could have gotten right and went on. But they didn't. I believe they could have still repented and went into the promised land up until this point. But when they heard the prayer, they heard the preaching, God intervened and all this stuff, and then they said, we're going to stone them with stone. And the glory of the Lord appears in the tabernacle of the congregation, verse 10. That was it. That was the cutoff. Up until that point, I believe they could have gotten right. And went on call. But they didn't. There's a lesson to be learned in this chapter that if we would repent of our sin and we would trust God God can forgive us and I like 1 John 1 9 if we confess our sin He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and, and we know in our mind that that's not a license to sin we know that God help us not to practice that. 
But if you practice that too long, God may say, okay, that's all we're going to do here. Uh, there's much to learn, probably way younger more than I'm drawing out here. But the children of Israel had so many opportunities. And I don't know what God may have dealt with you this week uh, through the meeting. Maybe He's dealt with you about one issue or another in your life. Uh, maybe it's not anything wrong. Maybe God's just provoking you to do something for Him. Don't let that pass by. Allow God to do what He wants to do in your life. Don't dwell in unbelief. You remember Moses many years before. He said, Lord, I can't talk. <laughs> I can't speak, Lord. Now God was merciful to him and kind to him. Seems like later on, that's the only one you hear talking. God can change a man. Thank God for that. God can change you. I thought about Sarah and, and how, uh, who was that was preaching on that the other day? Where they had, uh, she laughed. All the messages are starting to kind of run together in my mind. I can't keep them all sorted. Real talk. Okay. Uh, she laughed. Didn't she? What was that laugh? That sounded a little bit to me like unbelief. Didn't it? When you flip over to Hebrews chapter number 11, it's a big difference, I think. Sarah did what? She believed God. What are you saying? I'm saying she got right with God. I'm saying she repented and she got right with God and she did what she was supposed to do. She didn't stay in unbelief. The problem with these children of Israel here is they won't get out of it. They're wallowing in the mire like a hog of unbelief. They just will not get up and get out. So God says, okay. Stay there. Sometimes we need to hear the hard things to provoke us not to want to be in that. I don't want these consequences. I, I don't want to have to be crying and weeping all the time because I can't believe God. I, I don't want to be murmuring against God's men. I don't want to be uh, uh, wishing to be dead. I, I don't want to be desiring to go back to Egypt. I don't want to be wanting to kill somebody. I don't want to be rejected by God. I don't want to live that. While there's opportunity, I need to be, get right, get out of that mess, and go on for God. But don't dwell in that. It'll finally consume you. Well, that's just a few thoughts out of this passage of Scripture. Uh, Lord willing, we'll get a little brighter in the church. Amen. It's back to beans and tigers, you know what I mean? Okay, nice to you in the meeting. But, uh, I appreciate your attention. All right, we'll be back in just a few minutes. We'll try to church. Amen. Get this finished.